Good morning, everyone. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. The flame of our chalice this morning is a symbol of the warmth and brightness of our connections. The flame lights our way back together from our separate lives, and it lights our way forward into this new endeavor of adopting the eighth principle. Today is Youth Sunday. This service will be focused on the eighth principle, which is the theme for May. 
In two weeks, our congregation will vote on whether or not to adopt the eighth principle. We invite you to participate in making this big decision for our church. Our youth groups have worked hard for, on this service to demonstrate why adopting the principle is important to us. Hey everyone. Today's story is adapted from Making Promises, Making Covenants by Janine K. Griffmeyer. Oh, right, that. <laughs> so used to this. All right. All right, that's better. Do you remember your first day at school? Going to a new place and starting something new can be exciting, but also a little scary. On that first day of school, you might have a lot of questions. Where do I sit? What time do we eat? Where's the bathroom? Am I allowed to climb the trees? When can we go outside to play? Schools usually have some rules. Sometimes the teacher or principal came up with these rules. Sometimes the politicians came up with these rules. And sometimes kids come up with these rules. Once we know the rules, it's a little less scary. If everyone likes the rules and agrees to follow them, we can have a lot of fun. Sometimes, usually on the playground, we find ourselves in a situation where everyone wants to play a game together. But there aren't any rules yet. So we work together to compromise until we've come up with a set of rules that we can all agree to follow. Maybe you don't like the other kids' rules all that much, and maybe someone else doesn't like your rules all that much, but you agreed to follow them anyway because you got some rules you liked, and so did the other person. And finally, everyone promises, to, uh, promises each other to follow the rules with no cheating, and we can play the game. When we agree to follow the rules we make together, we are covenanting with one another. A covenant is a promise to each other about what we are going to do and how we're going to do it. We need a covenant to have fun playing a game. Covenants are not only for the playground. They can be made by families and students and teachers. They can be made in religions too. Our Unitarian Universalist religion has a covenant. Has a covenant. Our UU covenant was made about 50 years ago when there were two separate religions, Unitarians and Universalists. They realized that they had a lot in common. They were already playing by a lot of similar rules, so they decided to play together. It took almost a year, but the Unitarians and the Universalists from hundreds of different congregations eventually agreed on the six principles, six rules that they could all follow. 25 years later, in 1985, they added one more principle to make it seven. You may already have heard of the seven principles. This is the covenant that Unitarian Universalists agreed to follow. One, everyone is important. Two, everyone should be treated fairly and kindly. Three, we should accept one another and keep learning together. Four, Everyone must be free to search for what is true and right in life. Five, everyone should have a vote about the things that concern them. Six, we must work for a peaceful, fair, and free world. Seven, we must care for our planet Earth, the home we share with all living things. One of the nice things about covenants is that they're alive, not in the same way that you and I are alive, but in the same sense that they're always changing and growing. So in 2013, Paula Cole Jones and Bruce Pollock Johnson worked together to create an eighth principle because they thought our covenant needed to include something about Unitarian Universalists work to dismantle racism and white supremacy. Something like number eight, we work together for diversity, 
and against oppression and racism. This eighth principle isn't officially a part of our UU covenant yet, but many UUs have chosen to follow it as a rule anyways. These six principles guide us on Sunday and every day as we live our, universal, our Unitarian Universalist faith out loud. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice we support a new organization each month. Our recipient for May is Black Lives of UU, also known as Blue. Since its inception in 2015, Blue has grown to be a place where Black UUs can expand their power and capacity within our faith, minister to the particular needs of Black UUs, and work together for justice and liberation. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We have now reached the part of our service set aside for meditation and prayer, beginning with the sharing of joys and sorrows. A joy from Larry Larson. I will light a candle in honor of my mother for her love and devotion to her three sons on this Mother's Day. I'm so grateful. Another joy from um, the Rummage Committee. Thanks to all of the dedicated volunteers who made this rummage sale, sale a success. Because of your efforts, we grossed over 14,000 and netted around 11,000. We had an amazing amount of rummage due to the four missed sales due to COVID-19. Additionally, Area nonprofits benefited with a donation of our unsold items. Will all who helped in any way please stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Hooray for you all. It is the sense of community and connection during the week that is the treasure we have found. We'll do it all again in the fall. Among life's joys, we also share in each other's sorrows. Kelly Taylor shares a, sor a sorrow. I'm sad to announce that my dad passed away on April 23rd. He died peacefully and we are thankful for that, but of course we're still sad. Thoughts and prayers would be appreciated. A sorrow from Colleen Cavanaugh and Dan Kosuth. Colleen's Aunt Patty passed away unexpectedly this past Saturday, April 30th, in her sleep. She was 93 years of age. She was a fiercely independent woman, a world traveler, and a lifelong learner. After graduating from Mary Grove College, she became an airline stewardess, then returned to school to complete a master's in education. She taught middle school in Birmingham until her retirement in 1993. She was opinionated, frugal, and very private, yet generous with her time and resources. She will be dearly missed. I invite you now to speak into the silence the names of those people you are holding in your hearts this morning. All those names, spoken and unspoken, we hold with love. Please join me in a spirit of prayer with these words, titled, Prayer for While in the Struggle, by Margalee Belazir. Spirit of light and love, spirit of resistance, spirit of generosity, that which serves as our conscience in this work that we do to dismantle white supremacy, to empower the marginalized, to insist that black lives matter, matter. We have been angered. We have been saddened. We have been pushed to the brink once more. We are also inspired and seem resolved to do better this time, to not simply get to the other side of this moment, but to get there morally healthier to get to a safer space for black bodies. Spirit, help us to understand that we each have a role in justice work, for our liberations are tied to one another's. Give us the clarity of mind to know what our individual part is in the struggle, that there are many ways to protest injustice. Help us to find our way and commit to it. Spirits, we ask for guidance. Send us strength and endurance. Help us to give our all to this and hold nothing back, for precious lives depend on it. We will be imperfect. Rest assured 
that we will mess up over and over again, and we must do it anyway. May we summon the courage to tear down the system of injustice and get busy creating a world community with justice for all. May it be so. Amen. To close this prayer, I invite you into a moment of silence. Hi, I'm Amanda, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, I'm Nick. My pronouns are all of them. We are the UU Community Church in Orange, Michigan. We believe now is the time for UU churches to adopt and act on the eighth principle. It is the next step in improving our churches. It's a great way to address racial injustice in ourselves and the world. It will help us be clear for what we stand for. It will make us examine what we say and do to make sure they reflect our best values. It will help people, more people who come to our churches feel like they belong. Now is the time. Good morning. My name is Nate Shrek, and I'm a junior in the Goosh Group. When talking about the eighth principle, one of the biggest things I hear is the fear of change or the hesitancy to add something. There are lots of questions such as, don't the other seven principles cover this? Or do we really need this? I think the answer to both of those questions is a clear and definitive yes. Not only is adopting the eighth principle an act of love, 
It is a continuation of our Unitarian Universalist legacy as justice-making people. The Unitarian Universalist Church of Birmingham in the 1950s and 60s was committed to ending segregation in their community. This congregation was heavily involved in the Selma to Montgomery March, as well as becoming a coordinating center for marches all across the country. Two Unitarian Universalists, including one from Detroit, were killed while protesting civil rights in the South. Additionally, the UCers advocated for equal rights while wrapping the church in caution tape to provide support for LGBTQ people. This gesture of goodwill is a congregation-defining moment that we should all be proud of. However, our justice-making cannot just be in the past. It is our duty to keep moving towards building a greater congregation, and through this action, we can keep working towards that. Ratifying and adopting the eighth principle would codify a principle that would help ensure the safety and welcoming of congregants of color. We cannot afford to revel in the justice of days past and not continue to advance our loving agenda. Through the adoption of the eighth principle, we can accomplish our goal accomplish the goal of furthering our mission of racial justice and unifying our community. Adopting the eighth principle would be a show of respect and support to all Unitarian Universalists, and personally, I think adopting it has helped me on my spiritual journey. Forming a spiritual link to the eighth principle helped me to understand it better and to connect with it in a greater way. I think it bolsters and connects greatly to the third principle, the third principle describes acceptance of one another and promoting spiritual growth in our congregations. I think there is no better example of spiritual growth throughout the congregation than an adoption of a principle and connecting to a new idea spiritually. The pursuit of growth and spirituality should not exist only for eighth graders and in the past. Forming a congregation-wide connection to a new and progressive idea will help us to build a greater beloved community and through expanding our social justice initiatives, helping us all on our spiritual journey. Hello. Okay, my name is Bowen, if you didn't know. I didn't put that on there, but I should just say that. Um, all right. When I first volunteered to write this reflection, I was really excited. I mean, this topic is something that I am very passionate about. However, sitting down and writing about this, I was stumped. I mean, what could I possibly have to say without just sounding like a 15-year-old kid with an opinion? It took me some time to come to the conclusion that we all have something worthwhile to say, and that when I have the opportunity to speak out against racism, racism, sorry, I should take it. My understanding of spiritual wholeness is feeling content with yourself as a spiritual being. It could also mean that all of your spiritual needs are met and you feel whole and complete. Not every person has the same understanding of what it means to be spiritually whole. As a community, our spiritual wholeness is tied to our values. And in order for us to journey towards spiritual wholeness together, we must work toward the eighth principle. From my understanding, racism is the oppression of people of color. It is a system set up so people of color have more barriers and less opportunities in life. There are many ways that racism occurs, and one of those ways is institutional racism. Another important concept to grasp is white privilege. White privilege is the unearned advantage that white people have just because we are white. For example, white people benefit from institutional racism. White privilege sometimes shows up as protection, access, and ability in everyday life. I think that a lot of white people do not understand that they have these advantages and that we can use these advantages for good. Instead of using privilege for our own benefit, we can use them to work to end racism. To me, anti-racism means stripping away the idea that white people have more value than other racial groups and working toward equity and opportunity. Anti-racism is all action-based, which means breaking out of societal norms, learning about racial justice, and unlearning racism. I understand that as a white person, 
white, as a white person, racism impacts me too. Not in the same way that it impacts people of color. To be spiritually whole, I must work for racial justice. I believe being racist damages your soul. It deteriorates who you are as a human, human being. Believing that your race has more value creates a perception of life that is a lie. Treating someone poorly impacts you. I mean, it isn't always easy to stand up for racial justice. Sometimes it might feel overwhelming or too much to handle, but there are a lot of little things we, we can all do, including educating ourselves about the privilege we hold and what we can do educating ourselves about oppression and what we can do to change it. Bring awareness about the privilege we hold based on our many social identities. Saying something when someone else does something racist, and when we do or say something racist, apologize and reflect on what we did. We could also ask, why did I say that? What are the experiences I have had in my life that allowed me to think or say that? What can I do to change my way of thinking? And how can I show up differently next time? Coming out of this reflection, I do not expect all of us to get everything right, but I do expect us to try, myself included. I make mistakes too. This is what it means to be human. It is what we do to change the world we live in that matters. Please rise and embody your spirit for our last hymn, Where Do We Come From? My name is Bridget Laurie, and I'm graduating high school this spring. <laughs> Growing up a UU here, here at BUC has had a very positive impact on my life. From participating in religious education, coming to and helping with special events, volunteering, and being a part of the kind community here. My family and I began attending BUC in 2010, so I was about seven years old. I started in the elementary school program, which at first I was very nervous about, and several times I made my mother come to class with me. I remember getting to know Eleanor and really enjoying listening to a story and doing a craft every week. In sixth and seventh grade, my dad was one of the main teachers, and I'm so glad I had the opportunity to learn about so many different religions. In eighth grade, I was in the OWL and ROPE programs. Though OWL was not the most fun class, we did get to have a snack in the middle of those classes, which was definitely the highlight. <laughs> I remember the years leading up to ROPE, the task of writing a credo seemed daunting. However, now looking back, I'm glad I had the experience of concretely thinking, what do I believe? What are my moral values? The rope trip to Boston was an extremely fun and unforgettable experience. Mystic Lake trips in middle school and cons in middle school and high school were extremely fun. And they were fun because they were full of such accepting and understanding groups of people. They were such welcoming and safe spaces and I value greatly the time I got to spend at them. I also got to work with my fellow classmates to host our own con here at BUC, which was incredibly fun. High school curriculums were super fun, like watching Twilight Zones or watching country music videos and discussing sexism. <laughs> During the worst of the pandemic, it was nice to have a place to check in. Along with RE, special events here at BUC have always been prevalent in my life. 
I loved decorating cookies on candy cane Sunday and buying the cookies beforehand with my mother while she was the RE assistant. I remember helping with Bake Off, eating pancake breakfasts, and holding daffodils on Daffodil Sunday. Through all the time I spent at BUC, what I think had the biggest impact on me was all of the kind people here I was surrounded by. Early on, not long after we started coming to BUC, my dad got sick and I remember getting lasagnas and dishes of food dropped off at our house from people from church. People who barely really knew us reaching out to help. My mother worked as the RE assistant here for several years, so I got to see some of the thoughtful work she, Kimmery, Eleanor, and the other RE teachers did to make the religious ed so inclusive, empathetic, and meaningful for all the youth. I'm grateful for other adults at BUC who gave me volunteer opportunities like shopping for and wrapping gifts for adoptive family and the banana Bananagrams program with kids at Walt Whitman Elementary School. It's hard to imagine if I hadn't been going to religious education here at BUC or how I would be different if I hadn't had these chances to, at a young age, discuss in a safe space a picture book about a boy whose pet hamster died or visit a Buddhist temple with my class on a weekend or be asked what I thought about things. I'm so thankful I got to grow up a Unitarian Universalist here at BUC. Thank you for listening. I'd like to invite high school seniors to join me at the chancel at this time for the bridging ceremony. And if you are a high school senior on Zoom, know that um, our community is not bound by these walls and that it extends out to include everyone joining from wherever you are. A bridging ceremony is a celebration of the transition from adolescence to young adulthood. Your lives are probably full right now of graduation and parties and saying goodbye to the people and places of your childhood. What makes a bridging ceremony different is that it speaks to the spiritual meaning of this transition. You are leaving behind your childhood and its protections for the grand adventure and the freedom of adulthood. This is a time of great joy. You should be totally aesthetic about the possibilities and the promise of your lives unfolding before you. And at the same time, it's reasonable for this experience to be bittersweet or anxiety provoking or just confusing, and welcome to adulthood. <laughs> Life is never just one thing. So as a reminder of the complexity of adulthood, we give you a rose with thorns at bridging ceremonies, because adult life is full of beauty and wonder, but it is also complicated and difficult. Your life will have moments of joy and moments of sorrow. There will be times when you win, times when you lose, and the truth is that the world is not yours for the taking. It's quite the opposite. Your job, now that you are adults, is to work for healing the world, to help others deal with their thorns, and to let them help you with yours. So we give you a rose with thorns because we know you are ready for it. You're confident that you will be able to handle whatever comes your way. And I want you to know that through the seasons of your life, you will always have a home in Unitarian Universalism, and you always have a home in this congregation. So it is in that spirit that I would like to invite the congregation to join me in offering a blessing to the bridging youth. I will start, and then I invite you to read the words on the screen. Bridging high school seniors, today you leave behind your identity as youth, and we welcome you as adults. On behalf of Birmingham Unitarian Church, I present you with these roses, a symbol of the beauty and difficulty of adulthood. We give them to you with the thorns because we know that you are ready for the fullness of life.
We also have for you this book, it's called Becoming. It's a collection of words and wisdom that I hope will guide you as you set out on the path ahead. Now a blessing from Reverend Mandy. Jade and Bridget, you have come to a really difficult and exciting crossroad in life. And I I'm, I'm, want to make sure that you heard earlier that you know there's this, this thing that happens around this time uh, when people say, go out and conquer the world. And it's hard to not find a card that says something about conquering the world. That's the thing we kind of discourage in Unitarian Universalism. We're trying to move away from conquering. <laughs> and trying to go more towards healing. So I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page before you uh, leave here today, that um, our job is not to take over the world. It's to support and heal the world and, and each other. Right? And the other thing that you will find, and I'm sure people have said to you, and it's all over those cards, that, that is also a, a falsehood, a lie, is that um, it is now also your job to fix everything. That is also not true. It is not your job to fix things. Don't let older people, like that, and people that are older than you, put that on you. That it's your job to go out here and, and fix stuff that's been messed up and change the world for better. And it's all of our job to fix things. And it's all of our job to change the world for better. And that doesn't start when you're 18 and it doesn't stop when you're 50, right? It starts when you're born and it ends when you die. And everybody has a part to contribute to that. Those of you who haven't made it up here yet for bridging, you contribute also to fixing things in the world and um, all of us have to continue doing that. Um, but there's a particular, I think, pressure on people between the ages of like 18 to 25 to fix it. None of us wanted what happened to you in high school. None of us wanted the world to be the way that it is. None of us wanted uh, for you to be going out now to explore your young adulthood under the, the shadow of COVID and wars and difficulties. And I wanna make sure that you know that too. We can't help it. The world goes this way sometimes, right? So I say to you, welcome. Welcome to the project of adulthood and the project of trying to make things better Thank you for joining us here. Don't take on too much of a leadership role just yet. As you go out there, I charge you to follow every road that interests you as long as it interests you and then to have the courage to get off of it when the time comes and to not feel beholden or stuck doing something just because you used to like it a few years ago. But to be able to have the, the courage and the, uh, the foresight to see what is of interest and then to find in that value that doesn't have anything to do with making money, but has everything to do with making you who you want to be in the world. And to be able to find that when those roads take you into the, the depths of despairs and all the places that you may not want to go, to find value there too, right? That no matter what life throws at you, may you have the courage and the creativity to find a lesson somewhere in there of strength and courage. And even if the lesson is like, whoo, that was terrible and I never want to do it again, that's okay. It doesn't have to be more profound than that. Okay, may you give yourselves and each other grace to mess up and to have fun and failure and to find ways to persevere when the times get hard. May you go out there and find more and more of the world that you didn't know was there and tell everybody else about it in the hopes of them having options and opportunities too. May you know your limits as healthy May you know your bodies and your lives as sacred. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. And Nico, before we turn it back over to you, we have one more, one more thing we need to do. Thank you, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Thanks. Before we go, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who helped with you Sunday this year and extend a huge thank you to our DRE, Nico Van Ostrand. Um, Nico has been teaching and coordinating all of, uh, youth group, all of the youth groups virtually this year, and they have contributed to the spiritual growth of many, many kids as the year went on. Uh, they have been an incredible help with expanding social justice and advocacy 
including helping us to ratify the eighth principle and working with us on an anti-racism workshop over the summer. Um, they have consistently been a symbol of inspiration and strength as seen through their dedication to advocacy. Thank you so much for your hard work, Nico. So not fair to make me emotional before I have to come back up and talk, but <laughs> thank you. So at this time, I'd like to invite every single adult who has served as an advisor, teacher, mentor, or guide for this year's Bridging Seniors to go to the back of the sanctuary because this is not work that I do alone. So any adult who's played a role in the formation of our Bridging Seniors, that means if you have done anything with RE for the past 12 years, <laughs> head on to the back of the sanctuary. In a moment, the seniors will come to you to be received and welcomed. And actually, I'll invite the seniors to come back up to the front where you were before. Sorry for the multiple transitions. Thank you. <laughs> Now I'll invite everyone else to rise in body or spirit and turn towards the center aisle from wherever you are. Lift your arms up and make, we'll make an arch. So it'll be a kind of a big arch from all the sides. And if you're on Zoom, I invite you to lift your arms up as well from wherever you are. We're making an arch um, on the screens too. And those of you standing at the back of the room, I know you're gonna wanna say lots of nice things to the seniors when they get there, but just hold on until we get to the end of the benediction um, so we can be fully <laughs> present for this ritual. So seniors, as you head down the center aisle, know that every single person here and on Zoom is rooting for you and supporting you and ready to invite your whole self into their midst. Please go down the center aisle and stand at the back, surrounded by the adults who are part of your formation here. I invite you to remain where you are for the benediction. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and of joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.